Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the third uh, webinar of our uh, Arrhythmia series uh, throughout the month of September. Today, we are discussing cases of uh, atrial fibrillation and uh, ventricular tachycardia. Uh, probably this might be the most important uh, session of uh, this month, uh, since we're talking about the most common and the most serious arrhythmias uh, related to uh, uh, the arrhythmia webinar we are uh, holding this uh, month. Uh, the first uh, speaker is Dr. Marwan Rifad from uh, AUBMC, one of our colleagues. He will be discussing a case of uh, ventricular tachycardia, what a general cardiologist should know and should, uh, how should the general cardiologist and the primary care physician approach such a case. Marwan. Thank you very much, Dr. Bernard, for the presentation. I'd like to take the opportunity and thank the organizers, Dr. Bernard Bissarah from Dr. Uh, Bernard Harbiyi for the invitation. And I'm going to go through this presentation in case in based on approach. Room. I have no disclosure relevant to this presentation. So let's start with this case that was sent to you. So we have a 62-year-old man with history of coronary artery disease. Mm -hmm. The patient had a myocardial infarction a year ago. And he comes to the emergency room with tachycardia at 170 beat per minute. And as here, he has also some palpitations. And his blood pressure is 110 over 65 uh, millimeter of uh, mercury. And this is his EKG. So you're going to see this patient in the emergency room. You have this EKG in front of you. So as you see, you have a white complex tachycardia. And uh, you look at uh, <coughs> basically the, the EKG and you see that it's irregular. It's a regular white complex tachycardia. The thing that should come to your mind is what's the differential? What is the differential of a regular white complex tachycardia? So this is the differential diagnosis. I have a patient with a regular white complex tachycardia. It could be an SVT, it could be a supraventricular tachycardia with aberrancy, and the aberrancy could be uh, a structural one or a functional one. It could be a pre-excitation, a uh, wolf parkinson white with SVT, and it also could be a ventricular tachycardia. Uh, so you have to go through the differential. It's very important as a primary care physician and also as cardiologists to be able to differentiate uh, an SVT versus VT. Uh, how can we differentiate uh, SVT versus VT? Well, we have many alg uh, algorithms. I'm going to make it uh, simple, uh, simply simplify the approach for you. So first of all, when we talk about uh, a white complex tachycardia, we mentioned that we have a left bundle branch block morphology or a right, a right bundle branch block morphology. When we talk about right bundle or left bundle, what we mean is what's the final deflection of in V1. If the final deflection is positive, like here, we say we in V1, we say we have a right bundle morphology. If it's a negative, then we say we have left bundle morphology VT. This is from Dr. Miller's paper. It's very important to note, if you have on EKG AV dissociation, if you have an EKG that shows AV dissociation, this is ventricular tachycardia. It cannot be an SVT. If you have fusion beat like here, it's ventricular tachycardia. It's very important not to miss it in the emergency room, okay? So you have to treat the patient as ventricular tachycardia. Now they mentioned in this paper about QRS duration and axis, how it can favor VTAC. And they mentioned that if the QRS is wide, more than 160 millise uh, millisecond, or if it's uh, a right bundle morphology, more than 140, it favors VTAC. Also about the axis, if the axis is in the no man's land or the superior the right superior uh, access uh, region it's it's favors vtac uh, what i want you to know that you, sometimes you cannot differentiate svt versus vt based on just qrs and access so you have to go through an algorithm and what's the algorithm we have many algorithms so the one that we frequently use is the brugada algorithm that takes into account many of the parameters one uh, do we have, what's the precordial uh, lead? The, uh, do we have RS in the precordial lead? If we don't have RS, it's beta. If we have RS, then what's the duration from the onset of the R to the nadir of the S? What's the largest one? If we have one that exceeds 100 milliseconds, we have beta. If we don't have uh, those two criteria, then we try to look for a V dissociation. If we find, then it's beta. If we don't, then we look for morphology criteria. So you remember in SVT, it should uh, v1 should look like an rs r prime if we see like a big r qr rs in v1 it favors what it favors vtac then in left bundle morphology if we look at a wide r like r more than 30 millisecond or we for the duration from r to the nadir of the s more than 60 millisecond uh, or we have notch down stroke these favors vtac if we see a q wave in v6 this favors vtac because we should not see a q wave in left bundle branch block so these are good tricks that you should use when you go to the emergency room. 
a recent publication that's very useful is AVR. AVR is your friend. If you see a big R in AVR, it cannot be but VTAC. Because remember, what is AVR? AVR is, remember, it's on the right side. If it's positive, then it's the, the activation is coming down up. So it cannot be an SVT. It's VTAC. So very important to look at AVR. Now, if you don't see a big R in AVR, but you see very a small R or a Q wave, you look at the duration of the initial R or Q. If it's more than 40 milliseconds, it favors VTAC. If not, you will just have a negative AVR. You look if you have some notching. If there is notching, then it favors VTAC. If there is no notching, then you look at the initial 40 millisecond and the last 40 millisecond. And you see, if it's, you have a very sharp downstroke, it favors uh, an SVT. If not, it favors VTAC. I'll come to these in, uh, in, the, in these slides. So this is the Brugada algorithm I mentioned, uh, basically. Uh, and this is the EKG I, I, I talked to you. So basically, you look, do we have <coughs> RS complex? Do, do, we, do we have RS complex? Here we have, OK? So we have so we have an RS here, okay? We have an RS here. So we have to go to step number two. What's the duration from the R to the nadir of the S? Do we have more than 100 milliseconds in any lead? Here it's not. So if you measure it from the beginning of the R to the nadir of the S, it's it's uh, it's not more than 100. So we have to go to the third step. Do we have AV dissociation? In the EKG I, I mentioned to you, there is no AV dissociation. Then you look for the morphology criteria. And here we have positive in V1 that the morphology does not look like a typical right bundle mesh block. So it favors AV tag. Now, this is the next algorithm, the Verekai algorithm, that also looks at AV dissociation, if it's present. In our, it was, it was not clear. Do we look, do we have an initial R in AVR, where it's very, very useful? You look at AVR, we have a big R wave, so it favors VTAC, okay? And this is the third, uh, and, and then uh, the, the VI over VT, the one I mentioned, you look at the 40 millisecond, so this is an example. You look at AVR, you take the first, first 40 millisecond and the last 40 millisecond, and you measure the voltage, and you divide the voltage, the initial voltage by the terminal voltage. If the ratio is more than one, it favors an SVT. And this is the last, uh, the, uh, the last algorithm would just look at AVR. It's very useful and I advise you, advise all uh, cardiologists and also primary care physicians to use this algorithm because very, very helpful. Whenever you're faced with the wide complex tachycardia, look at AVR. If you have an initial uh, positive AVR, it favors VTAC. If not, then you look at the presence of an initial R or a Q wave, more than 40 milliseconds. If you see it, it favors VTAC. If not, you look if there's notching in AVR. If yes, then it's VTAC. If not, then you look at this ratio I mentioned. And if the ratio is less than one, it favors VTAC. And this is uh, a paper I, I published with Dr. Patrick Zakka, who's now chief resident at Emory. Uh, it, it goes over all the criteria to differentiate SVT or VT. I want to add this new criteria published by the Brugada group, Joseph Brugada group, which, which called uh, 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 PAVA, and this to PAVA, which basically looks at lead two. If you measure the R wave to peak time, so from the beginning of the R wave to the peak uh, and lead to, if it's more than 50 milliseconds in their uh, study, it favors VTAC. Now let's go back to our patient. So we have this. Uh, so if I stop you here, sure, Marwan, sure. Uh, you mentioned the uh, very nice papers, uh, very nice algorithms that are pretty accurate. But if I'm an ER physician and, you know, I'm in a hurry, I have several patients, what single criteria would you recommend the ER to look at to have to have quick answer about what's uh, this going is, on. This is a great uh, question, dear Bernard. So we look at AVR, very easy. You look at AVR quickly, positive AVR, it's VTAC. Thank you. Now back to our patient. We have a 62-year-old man with CAD, that's post-MI, a year ago, comes to the ER with tachycardia at 170 beat per minute with palpitations. And I mentioned here his blood pressure was 110 over 65. This is an EKG. We went through it together. So uh, as you see, as I've mentioned before, we have a right we have a regular white complex tachycardia, and as I've said, AVR is positive, so it's VTAC, okay? And uh, since he has an MI, one thing as ectophysiologists, we also try to look where it's coming from. So you look here, the 2, 3 AVF, you have negative, so probably it's coming from an inferior area. V1 is positive, so it's coming from the left ventricle. So probably from the left ventricle, an inferior area of the left ventricle. One is negative, so probably <coughs> around, probably a scar in the lateral area. Okay, and the transition here, you look at V1 positive, V2 positive, V3 positive, then it's neg negative here, so probably around the mid LV area. So we have an idea where it's coming from. So let's see, let's go over the management. So I have this patient. So again, okay, another thing that is uh, important, uh, I, maybe you'll mention it a bit, that in someone who's got, who's got structural heart disease, any white complex tachycardia is a VT until proven otherwise. Absolutely, right? absolutely. Whenever you have in doubt, patient to have MI, his MI, you see white complex, it's VTAC, VTAC unless proven otherwise. Absolutely. Uh, then we go to management. What do you do with, with such patients? You give IV amiodarone, 
Do you give a beta blocker? Do you start inotropes and vasopressors? Or do you go ahead and do a synchronized cardioversion? We'll come to the management criteria. Now, I'm, I'm going to mention the same patient, same presentation that you have. 62-year-old man with coronary artery disease who had an MI a year ago, comes to the ER with tachycardia, 170 beats per minute, but now he has some decreased level of consciousness and his blood pressure is now 65 over 45 millimeter of mercury. So, so now we have a case where we have, uh, the first one was more stable, the second case was pretty much a little bit unst uh, more unstable. What do you do? Amiodarone, beta blocker, inotropes, uh, slash vasopressors, or synchronized cardioversion. To answer this in the management, the recent uh, 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 guidelines that I advise you all to go over it, it's a 2017 uh, uh, from the American College, uh, American College of Cardiology, American Heart Association, and the Heart Rhythm Society. It put together how we manage patients with ventricular arrhythmias and to prevent sudden cardiac death. Uh, the first author was Dr. Sanal Khatib, the fellow Lebanese. So here, the, here, how we go with the management. So we have a patient, like our patient, with sustained monomorphic VTAC. We look, first of all, in the emergency room, is the patient stable or unstable? If the patient is unstable, like the second case, some level, uh, decreased level of consciousness, but pressure is going down, you have to shock the patient. So you, you do a synchronized cardioversion. If the patient is, is, is stable, so you have basically blood pressure, is, is, uh, you have blood pressure, patient is, is fine, uh, that, uh, have some palpitation, but he's, he's hemodynamically stable, you do 12 VDKG, you do a history exam, uh, and then uh, you, you, you go over uh, uh, the history and the VTAC he has. If you have a structural heart disease like our patient who has an MI a year ago, then it's a class one indication to do cardioversion. And class 2A to give IV procainamide, which we don't have in Lebanon, and 2B to give amiodarone, IV amiodarone or sotalol. If the VT terminates, uh, if the VT terminates, then you have uh, to basically treat the, treat the patient, see the underlying heart disease, you have any underlying heart disease. Uh, if the, the uh, VT does not terminate, you have to shock the patient. If the, if the again, the VT does not terminate, then you have to start sedation, give uh, uh, anesthesia. The anesthesia team will, will, will help some, uh, will help in giving high sedation to calm down the, the, the ventricular tachycardia. And uh, uh, we might need to repeat the cardioversion as well. Now, Any role for lidocaine in this case? Lidocaine? If, if it's ischemic, there is a role for, for lidocaine as well. And from my experience, also lidocaine works very well, especially in the ischemic uh, VTAC. Now, in case you are in the emergency room and the VT is still continue, you don't terminate the tachycardia, <coughs> there is an indication to do catheter ablation, okay? I'm not going into detail, but you, 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 you will take the patient to the EP lab and to, to uh, basically uh, address the circuit and terminate the tachycardia. Uh, let's go uh, basically. Now, one thing in this patient that I mentioned, so this patient had uh, basically um, I a year ago, and he comes in with VTAC. So pretty much he meets indication uh, for, uh, for ICDs. So I'm going to remind you about those indications. So this patient basically comes, he had a sustained mono, uh, monomorphic VTAC. Uh, first of all, we try to see, does he have any ischemia? So uh, look, usually we look at the EKG, if we have a polymorphic VTAC, so we have two types of VTAC. We have monomorphic and polymorphic. What's the difference? If we if we see same uh, QRS like in our patient, it's more monomorphic. So probably most likely there is a scar and there is uh, basically a, a, a circuit going around the scar. If it's polymorphic, you have to rule out underlying ischemia. Even if he has an MI and it was the rest a year ago, he might have another ischemia. So you need to take the patient to the, uh, to the cath lab and look at the coronaries and probably uh, look if there is any uh, need to revascularize the patient. If there is no ischemia, then the patient has an indication for ICD, okay? Because he had uh, basically sustained VTAC. You have to assess the candidacy, of course. If he has a good functional capacity, you expect that he live at least one year, then you go ahead and put an ICD. If not, then you have to uh, follow uh, medical therapy, the guideline directed medical therapy. Now let's go back to our patient. Our patient is a 62 year old man with coronary artery disease, has an MI a year ago, comes to the ED with this tachycardia, 170 beat per minute. So one thing <coughs> very important is to get this piece of information. Did the patient had, when he left the hospital a year ago, what was his ejection fraction? This is very important. This patient has cardiomyopathy. So did he have cardiomyopathy after he left the hospital? Was, did he have any reduced ejection fraction? Did he leave the hospital? The EF was less than 40%. What are the things that we could have done to this patient? So it's very important. Uh, in any patient who had who, ha, who has a reduced ejection fraction, uh, and it's in the, in the uh, AHA guidelines and AC guidelines, if the F is at 40%, the patient need to be on medical therapy, including beta blocker, 
mineral corticoid uh, receptor antagonist, uh, as well as ACE inhibitor slash ARB or ARNIs to, of course, reduce risk of sudden cardiac death. And this is very important. Like this patient a year ago, if he had the MI one year ago, and uh, basically uh, the MI, let's say he was revascularized or not, we have to wait. If he has an MI, just an MI, no revascularization, you wait 40 days, at least 40 days. Uh, uh, if, if you had revascularization via an stent or a cabbage, you have to wait to wait three months. And then if, if uh, after three months, or uh, after the revascularization or 40 days, you look at the ejection fraction. If uh, less than 30% and then the NIHA class one, you have to put an ICD. If it's class two or three, uh, basically, and the F less than 35%, uh, there is an indication for uh, ICD as well. Now, if the EF is 40% or less. But let's remind the, the audience here that right. we're talking about primary prevention. We're not talking about this case that the patient Absolutely. presented with ventricular tachycardia. Absolutely. That's someone who's got uh, yeah. heart I'm failure. Going back, I'm telling you what should have been done initially. Because unfortunately, we're seeing patients who had low ejection fraction and did not get device therapy. So this patient, if, if he has low ejection fraction a year ago, he needs to. we need to go through this algorithm and see if he uh, ha had been a potential uh, he requir required a device therapy to prevent sudden death and uh, VITA. And we have several options. Initially, we used to put the device, uh, I mean, uh, for first of all, in, in the several decades, we, it was the abdominal, now transvenous, and recently we can put subcutaneous ICD. And subcutaneous ICD is now in the guidelines, especially it's a class one indication if patients have poor vascular access and uh, if they don't need any uh, treatment for bradycardia. Uh, and uh, in other patients where there is no indication for uh, pacing, it's also reasonable to implant subcutaneous ICD, which is uh, basically we do an incision in the axilla and an incision next to the sternum, and we don't uh, basically go through the vasculature. <coughs> guidelines are focusing a lot on shared decision making. I mean, though clinically and the guidelines will mention that the patient will need to put an ICD, it's very important to sit down with the patient and go over basically their goals, preferences, values, discuss potential complications. It's very important to go through over it. It's all the guidelines mention this, that the discussion need to be made to the patient. Now the patient, let's say the patient has the ICD and comes back with VT or VF, recurrent episodes. Now it's very important to look also at the VT. If it's a sustained monomorphic, we, we can give amiodarone or sotalol, or we can also reasonable to do ablation. The guideline mentioned it clearly. Now, if the arrhythmia are not controlled on medication, the patient need to have uh, ablation, catheter ablation. And I'll mention what, what do we do in, uh, in some such cases. Now, let's go back to our, again, to this case I mentioned, 62 year old man with CAD, Satsmos MI, year ago, uh, who had an MI year ago, comes to the ED with tachycardia 170 beats per minute. And now, let's say you have this rhythm. And clearly, on this rhythm, if you look when uh, the isolactic is stable, you look like different morphology, it's poly more polymorphic. The guy, in this case, basically, you go through this algorithm, try to look for reversible causes. If, if it's ischemia, the patient need uh, to, to have coronary uh, ischemic workup, coronary angiography, potential revascularization, maybe if you had a stent, now it's, you have uh, stenosis. Uh, it's very important to look at drugs. Well, what medications are he taking? Is he on any medications that prolong the QT interval? Is, is any problem with electrolytes? Any potassium problem, magnesium problem? Very important to address them. Stop any QT prolonging medication address revascularization. If there is no reversible cause, then uh, class one is to start amiodarone, or we can also give beta blocker and lidocaine. And if the arrhythmia is not controlled, there is, uh, there is an indication for uh, ablation. We look for the triggers. We look what is the triggering PVC for those polymorphic, and there's data that ablation can help uh, in, in this, uh, uh, basically in, in this case. If, if, if not, if it's not controlled, then we can do autonomic modulation. And in polymorphic VTAC, how, how would you approach such patient? Because I focused initially on monomorphic VTAC. So first of all, if you have unstable polymorphic VTAC, you have to do emergent defibrillation. If it's stable, the patient is more stable, usually they terminate on their own. However, they tend to recur. So it's very important to address reversible causes or things that uh, basically bring it back again. Whenever you have sinus rhythm, grab a quick, do a quick EKG, look at the QT interval. Are we dealing with normal QT or prolonged QT? Uh, usually if it's prolonged as a normal QT, you <coughs> manage it as you manage monomorphic VTAC. If you have prolonged QT, you have to address what's the problem. If you have electrolyte problems, hypokalemia, hypomagnesemia, you have to, uh, to correct them. Aim for potassium more than four, magnesium more than two. And magnesium sulfate, very helpful, especially in prolonged QT. You have to give magnesium sulfate to gram IV and maintenance. And of course, if you look how it starts, if it's brady dependent or post dependent, you will need to give isoproterenol or pacing. Now, there is this, uh, uh, I mentioned a lot about catheter ablation. 
one thing the guideline mentioned that in case you have structural heart disease and the patient failed endocardial ablation, the patient could be could uh, need an epicardial ablation. So it's very important to look if the, there's a focus in the epicardium. Now, one thing in a patient who had coronary artery disease, had an MI, it's very important to look at the substrate. Why does he have VTAC? In a, in a, whenever you have an MI, you have a scar, you have scarring. And I want you to look at scar at three dimension. It's like uh, it's three dimensional structure and the reentrant is, is, is three dimensional. And the substrate is the scar itself as well as the adjacent normal, normal tissue that we refer to as the border zone. So we have several uh, mechanisms that favors uh, VTAC in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, including fibrosis, but also there is some gap junction disruption, there is non-uniform conduction, then some ion channel remodeling, and the muscle bundles are separated. So all of these favor the uh, reentrant mechanisms. So here, an example of a patient who had a scar. You see the scar here. You see around the scar, you have the border zone. So we have this reentrant rhythm, the circuit. So uh, we try, as I've mentioned before, we, we try to address, control the, uh, the rhythm by medications. Uh, but uh, in some cases, we cannot control them just by medications. So this is when we start uh, and go to ablation. And in ablation, we put catheters. We look for some signals, some abnormal signals with low voltage, fractionated, late potential, and then ablate. Uh, and there are several techniques how to ablate and, uh, and uh, transect the scar. I'm not to go into detail. We, there is two approach to ablate uh, uh, VTAC. If we have a VTAC that's stable, uh, then we always try to induce. We have try, always try to address and do the ablation during VTAC because we can localize what is the circuit. You look at special signals that you can address during ablation. We can do something. I'm not going to go into detail, but we can know where is the isthmus, where is the entrance of the tachycardia and successfully ablate the, the VTAC. But sometimes the VT is not hemodynamically stable. Then we do something called substrate modification where we can uh, pretty much localize where is the scar and uh, basically ad address the scar. There's a lot of techniques how to do it. I'm not to go into detail, but uh, there's, uh, whether you do any of those techniques, the, the key thing is to try to do a complete substrate modification to uh, prevent recurrence of ventricular <coughs> arrhythmia. And I mentioned the most common uh, arrhythmia is reentrant arrhythmia in patients who have myocardial scar, but sometimes you have some focal VTAC and usually the electrophysiologist will identify during the, uh, the mapping and ablation. In the end, I'm going to end this presentation by uh, showing many of the trials that showed the benefit of ablation in patients. So I'm going to, so there are three randomized clinical trials that took patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy. They compared patients who had ablation with ICD versus, for example, ICD alone, the smash VTAC, it showed favorable outcome for those who had ablation. The VTAC also took patients with uh, ischemic cardiomyopathy and uh, showed basically benefit for ablation. And the Vanish by Dr. Uh, Sapp showed also uh, that in patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy, ablation was superior than escalation of treatment. So you don't just escalate antiarrhythmic, ablation had favorable outcome. Also other observation and retrospective study, uh, the thermocool VT ablation study and the IV TCC showed also benefit of ablation. So this is something you need to uh, uh, refer patient to active physiologist and to help the patient. I would like to take the opportunity and thank you for the invitation and thank you for the attention of this presentation. Happy to take any question. Thank you, Marwan, for this uh, beautiful uh, discussion about uh, ventricular tachycardia. We have some uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I guess there was a question about when would you, uh, can you do endocardial ablation in somebody who has an apical thrombus or old thrombus and would this be an indication to go for epicardial ablation? Well, yes, if you have a, a thrombus, it's also indicated to do, uh, to do uh, probably epicardial. Yes, sure. I guess if it's uh, an old thrombus calcified, maybe sometimes yeah, you yeah. could take the risk, but yeah. it's a fresh thrombus, yeah. you shouldn't do that. Just a couple of questions from my end, just to help general cardiologists. So you talked about differential diagnosis for white complex tachycardia, SVT, aberrancy, or VT. Could you just mention a word about the class 1C induced rhythm? Unfortunately, we do see lots of people who have structural heart disease kept on flaconide and propafenone. So could you mention uh, what could this cause in terms of rhythm? Absolutely. So, so, so the, the, there is a study, the CAST study, have shown that patients who have underlying sexual heart disease, if they take antiarrhythmics like flecanide and also extrapolate this to propafenone because they are on the same class, class 1C antiarrhythmic, those patients might, uh, might have ventricular tachyarrhythmia and sudden cardiac death. So these patients should not have those medications. Very important not to be given uh, class 1C. Okay? Sure. And those patients should not do not need ablation, do not need anything. They just need to stop the class 1C Absolutely. because this is a sign of toxicity. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then another question for the general cardiologist as well. So back to your case, 
you have somebody with a VT, is there any type of VT that looks different from this VT where you exclude ischemia or an infarct, but would not rush your patient for an ICD and so, would favor ablation without considering devices? Of course, I mean, I, mean, I, I, mean, I mentioned the case who had a patient who had an MI comes in with VT probably scar related, but sometimes if you look at the VT and it looks like more like fascicular VT or look at the VT and it looks like, it looks like an outflow VT, so VT. So those patients, you don't have to rush and put ICD on those patients, but uh, of course you can take them to the AP lab and uh, and uh, ablate the focus and it has high success rate also some tachycardia they respond very beautifully to medications like fascicular vt tend to respond uh, very well to verbamil or transfrenal blockers so we tend to give uh, the patient uh, those therapy as well marwan i have a small question yes. especially for the cardiologist when you say ablation is superior to icd i'm sure a lot of people are hearing you now they want to know a few things most of them they know that patient has vt ischemic they give him amyo and they put ICDs. So what is the thing you can tell them? One, what should be the success rate if they send their patient? What's the recurrence rate so that they would be more excited to send the patient to EP? Because we are discussing it very EP level. Let's go very basic cardiology where they see patient more than us most of the time. So what's your success rate in ischemic patient having VT? Well, the success, I mean, the success rate in, in outflow and fascicular is high. You're taking more than 90%. And those scar-related VTAC, ischemic, it's a little bit on, a little lower than that, but it's close to 80% in this board game. Now, it depends where is the scar yeah. and the location. And is the scar more uh, like a big scar, more to the uh, epicardium, then the success rate will, will decrease. Uh, will decrease. Okay. And but uh, also very important is how is the VTAC uh, hemodynamically uh, tolerated or not? Because if it's tolerated and we can induce VT in the EP lab and really we can identify, and go into detail, but we can identify those channels, those isthmus, the entrance, exit, exit, then you can go to the isthmus and ablate it with high success rate. If it's uh, hemodynamically uh, not tolerated, then basically uh, you, we, we, we sub, mod, modify the substrate. Yeah, this is the there thing. is some data that you can put patients into mechanical uh, uh, support. So you can put put like an uh, balloon pump or ECMO and uh, to, uh, and basically do the activation mapping. But uh, the approach that we're doing here is basically substrate modification. Yeah, thank you, Marwan. This was very important because when they refer patient to you, they should know. Yeah. If he has a stable VT, the success would be higher. Yeah. Not patient who is having a lot of VT is being shocked several times, they send it for you at the last resort, Absolutely. and this patient will not be an easy case. Absolutely. And there is a case, or there is also a paper from uh, UPAN about early referral and late referral. Uh, a colleague of mine uh, published it, Dr. David Frankel. And if the, uh, when, whenever the, the patient is referred early, they have higher success rate. Sure. Yeah. Thank you. So one other question uh, about life vest. Is it an option in Lebanon? I guess it is not. But is there any road for life vest? So in, the, in the guidelines, they mentioned... If we get to so get in it in the future. Yeah. So in the guidelines, they mention it. If I uh, just go quick, uh, briefly to the algorithm here. Uh, so here, so what live vest uh, uh, is basically under the wearable, we call the wearable uh, cardiac defibrillator. Uh, so after NMI, those patients who have high risk, but they don't meet the criteria yet. I mean, we cannot put, uh, if a patient has an event and it's uh, revascularized, you have to wait three, uh, uh, three months for random prevention. So in this, in, in, in this period, we can put a, a live vest or wearable defibrillator. It's a 2B indication. We don't have it in Lebanon. Okay, hopefully in the future we, we have it. In the past, we could have had it in the future. <laughs> it's not going to happen. So there's another question that you already, I believe, addressed. What's the role of uh, lidocaine? Yeah. So, so lidocaine also is antiarrhythmic. We use it in the treatment of VTAC. And usually lidocaine tend to be very helpful, especially in the ischemic, ischemic type of VTAC. Uh, and uh, basically, it, it works very well in controlling the, uh, the arrhythmia also acutely. Sure. So, so usually what we do, we, we give a methadone lidocaine or usually lidocaine fits ischemic sure. VTAC. Can I make a follow-up comment on uh, Dr. Maurice? So... Um, for the general cardiologist, when we talk about ablation and ICD, we don't mean that ablation can replace an ICD, Absolutely right? Not, yeah. So we have to clarify that we're giving ablation for somebody to stop getting recurrent ICD shocks. And shocks and, and therapies. And though, though I have to add that some, some centers, especially in Europe, they are, they are putting, they're doing ablation as first line. Sure. Well, that's yeah, not those, the guide. Yeah, it's not the guide yet. But, sure. uh, but, and they have they published uh, like in Europe and other journals some... Uh, uh, promising results whereby patients who meet indication for ICD, they took them to the EP lab, ablated uh, the VT, 
without putting ICD, sure. and they put, but it's not yet in the guideline. But the other extreme that you also mentioned, which is very important, there are people with VT, which is idiopathic VT, who should never get an ICD. Because if this is RVOT VT, fascicular VT, they'll get VT storms, Absolutely. and it's a contraindication to Absolutely. put a device. And, and these patients, you can control them without, basically by ablation with a very high success rate. <coughs> Perfect. Especially fascicular or RVOT. So great, but w one other uh, point, uh, I don't know if the audience got this idea uh, as clear as I think it should get to them because this is a matter of discussion that we get with several cardiologists, is about these patients that come to the ER with ventricular tachycardia, you take them to the lab the following morning or what have you after you have stabilized them and you do a cardiac uh, an angiogram on them and you find this 80% lesion in the RCA or in the LED and you open it up, is that enough? Well, I look, I look, I go back to the tachycardia itself. Is it, if it's monomorphic, if it's monomorphic, I'm, I'm less likely inclined to, to, to be this the culprit because usually most likely it's a scar related. If it's polymorphic, you might argue probably it was the culprit or ischemia. If it's monomorphic, probably it, it, this ischemia is, uh, I mean, you saw it as a bystander, but you need to address tachycardia and do that. Vision. Great, so exactly. So this is because the, this, this might be or might not be the cause of the ventricular Absolutely. tachycardia, Absolutely. and especially if the VT is hemodynamically unstable, Absolutely. you cannot afford to make a mistake and say this is the reason, and this is the etiology, and this is the reversible cause Absolutely. of this ventricular because tachycardia. Because the next event might be a death. Totally. And that's even mentioned in the guidelines. In the guidelines, they say revascularization is not enough. They, it's a class three indication to just revascularize. Right. <coughs> All right. Yeah, Any other questions? No. All right. Thank you, Marwan. Thank you very much. Uh, we will regroup in uh, two or three minutes for the next uh, uh, case, I guess. Thank you. CME credit, one CME credit per webinar. So hopefully, by, if you do the four webinars, you're going to get four CME credits from the Lebanese Order of Physician. It's a great pleasure to introduce my colleague, Dr. Benar Abi Saleh, who is the chairman of the Arrhythmia and Pacing Working Group at the Lebanese Society of Cardiology, and he going to talk, talk to us about atrial fibrillation. Bernard. Thank you, Marwan. Uh, I hope you guys are enjoying this uh, series of uh, cases. Uh, the next case is about atrial fibrillation. The next discussion is about atrial fibrillation. Uh, before I go to the case, I'd like to agree on some definitions that we as uh, cardiologists and electrophysiologists uh, utilize to characterize the atrial fibrillation because not all AFibs are created equal. And as most of you know, paroxysmal atrial fibrillation means those patients that get a fib in and out, uh, that go in and out of atrial fibrillation, they reverse spontaneously, or with the latest, or over the last 10 years, we've been uh, classifying uh, the patients that uh, get cardioverted in the less than, less than a week back into atrial fibrillation as paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. Persistent are those that go beyond uh, a week. These, these are the patients that have been in fib for several weeks or a month that come to us and we end up cardioverting them, whether being uh, with electrical or pharmacological cardioversion, most of the time it's a DC cardioversion, back to science for them. And there is this entity that we've been more and more utilizing nowadays, the long-standing AFib patient. This is the one that's been in FIB for more than 12 months, more than a year of uh, AFib, and you decide to put them back into sinus rhythm. This is the long-standing AFib. And the last category is the permanent atrial fibrillation. This is the chronic atrial fibrillation patient. This is the one that you pronounce as chronic atrial fibrillation. You're not going to seek signs of them. You're going to keep them in AFib. Uh, and you're not gonna bother and do any additional measures to put them back into sinus rhythm. And uh, this is another thing that uh, it's been a matter of debate. What's the definition of non-valvular atrial fibrillation? What do you mean by non-valvular atrial fibrillation? By guidelines, this is the AFib that is, uh, uh, it is the AFib uh, in the absence of rheumatic mitral stenosis or no mechanical or bioprostatic heart valve or mitral valve repair. So. Short of all these valvular uh, lesions, these particular valvular lesions, uh, non-valvular AFib is the one uh, that we, uh, the, the, the simple one that uh, we uh, treat uh, on a daily basis. Even, for example, a severe mitral regurgitation patient that is not uh, uh, due to a mechanical prosthesis, just my severe MR, is still a non-valvular AFib, all right? So, the next uh, uh, slide is about briefly about the mechanism. How do we understand AFib? How does AFib evolve? So it starts basically in most of the cases as paroxysmal, 
it move on to become a persist persistent, then it becomes permanent. Why? Because as it's written here, AFib becomes AFib. The more you leave the patient into atrial fibrillation, the more the patient is going to have atrial fibrillation. Hence the recent trend of early therapy for atrial fibrillation. And this is due to several mechanisms that's been described over uh, the years. That's uh, due to a short refractive period to the atrial myopathy that the patient uh, will have. Because the more you keep him in atrial fibrillation, the more you allow him to stay in atrial fibrillation, the more AFib he's going to have. And we, the way we understand the trigger of atrial fibrillation is that it comes down from, from these pulmonary veins down to the uh, uh, left atrium. That's where the atrial substrate will, uh, will uh, permit AFib to uh, uh, go on. So to go to our case, the case that I have here is a 67-year-old diabetic lady with dyspnea on moderate exertion found to have an irregular heart rhythm. She goes to her doctor with a blood pressure of 110 over 75 and a heart rate around 110. The, obviously, the cardiologist gets an EKG and diagnoses atrial fibrillation. This is a frequent scenario that probably most of you at least once a week or twice a week will see in, in, in clinic and uh, deal with these kind of cases. So what do you do? In this case, what should you do? What's the best, uh, best approach? Should I send the patient to the ER, give that patient 300 of amiodarone right now, right now, obviously with anticoagulation? Should I do a DC car reversion? Maybe it's better to just shock her the earlier the better, rather than waiting uh, on her. Should I give IV vernacadin, for example? It's been uh, gaining momentum uh, recently with anticoagulation uh, or should I wait, take a step back, observe her overnight, rate control her, anticoagulate, then I do a good, nice transesophageal echocardiography in the morning, and if the appendage is clear, I'll go ahead and do a cardioversion. So these are the scenarios that we have faced. So the yes, obviously, sorry, the Bernard, but, <coughs> sorry, Bernard, but you forgot one thing that you are seeing a lot these days. The, the, the fifth scenario where they do coronary angio, then they decide what to do. And this is always we are pushing not to do it. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khoury, for this very important point. A bit sarcastic, though. Yeah, because I don't know why they do, even they don't do echo. They do a coronary angio before the echo. I don't understand it till now. <clears throat> so uh, the best option in my mind is to uh, rate control the patient and anticoagulate as soon as possible and do a TEE and to rule out clot in the left atrium, and then uh, do uh, uh, a cardio version if the TE is clear. Now, if the patient's heart rate is well controlled, you don't have a TE uh, facility at your hospital, it's okay to anticoagulate the patient for four weeks. And if the patient is still in uh, AFib after four weeks, you can go ahead and cardio revert without even doing a TE. But nowadays, we're moving more and more towards uh, early uh, uh, rest uh, uh, restoration of signs for them because we know again a fib begets a fib the more we leave the patient in atrial fibrillation the more the patient is going to, going to have recurrence the more this left atrium is going to dilate and this is supported by the guidelines as well that uh, uh, it is it's a class 2 indication to go ahead and do it and cut over the patient now one modification to the guidelines in the 2019 AHA ECC guidelines that wasn't available or wasn't even permitted in the US is about doing a CAD reversion in those low risk patients without even looking. All right. So in the past, any patient, low chat score, whatever, with a fib, you would need, at least mm -hmm. in, in the US, to do a TEE before you can revert them unless the patient is anticoagulation. Now, with the latest update, it's okay, class to be, if your chat's vas score between zero and one. Uh, and the symptoms, you just here rely on, on symptoms. If the symptoms have been less than 48 hours, we always got taught not to rely on symptoms. You can go ahead, give a, a, a factor 10A inhibitor or direct thrombin inhibitor, then do, do a cardio version without even uh, uh, looking. So these are for those young 40 year old uh, patients, not, not more than that, which is Rare, in fact, most of our cases nowadays are diabetic, hypertensive, and so and uh, so on. So, why do we need to treat atrial fibrillation again? Because we need to prevent thromboembolic phenomena. We need to control the ventricular rate because the patient is so symptomatic. So, half of those patients, by controlling the ventricular rate, you control the symptoms. And the third thing, the third thing, is to get to the rhythm control. But the, the first, but the first thing and the most important thing is to prevent 
thromboembolism. And this is obviously by anticoagulating the patient. Uh, rate control, to get to rate control again, how do we rate control people? <coughs> rate controlling is by giving uh, beta blockers, calcium channel blockers, the joxins. So in 90% of the case, you can rate control the patient with these agents, with one or two of these uh, agents. Rhythm control, you end up giving Mederone, Dronaderone, Flecanide, Propafenone, a lot of antiarrhythmic that we will discuss later. But in the latest ESC uh, uh, meeting, uh, just last month, uh, there was a late breaking clinical trial about the rate AF trial, which brought back DIG into life because recently, over the last 10 or 20 years, we've been shying away from the Jackson because the famous DIG trial told us that it is something that is. That, get, that has a lot of side effects. Well, we've been utilizing it more and more recently, and we've been realizing that this old drug is still there. It's still safe. And in fact, in this particular trial, uh, it, it behaved very, very well. So the advantage of DIG, if you can think about it, that's someone someone who's in atrial fibrillation, and you, now you have a drug that acts, acts preferentially on the AV node. So if the patient reverses to sinus rhythm, you're not gonna make the patient that much that much uh, bradycardic, but if you're on beta blocker, for example, beta blocker will slow down the sinus node, so the patient will flip from AFib to sinus bradycardia if the patient is on beta blocker or in calcium, on calcium channel blocker. So that's why DIG is a pretty good drug, and we've been utilizing it more and more, especially in the cases of AFib with heart failure. So the next question would be, what's rate control? What do we mean by rate control? How aggressive should we be with rate control? Is it a heart rate of 100? Is it a heart rate of 80? Is it a heart rate of 120? Well, here comes the, the trial that's called linear versus strict control in patients with atrial fibrillation. So you do not need really to be in, uh, to, to be very aggressive with your rate controlling agent. So as, as long as your heart rate, as the resting heart rate is uh, uh, less than 110, I skipped slide here, looks like it. Let me go back. All right. As long as the heart rate is less than 110. OK, I don't know what's going on with the animation. You're OK. So you don't need to go down to the old teaching of less than 80. As long as the resting heart rate is less than, less than 110, we're, uh, we, we, are, we are OK. So you don't need to be very aggressive, because being aggressive, meaning more risk of heart block, more risk of sinus bradycardia, more risk of pauses, with post-conversion pauses, and so on. So just 110 is okay. So if my patient's heart rate is 100, I don't need to push any harder. So to go, to go back to the more important issue of uh, anticoagulation, how do we anticoagulate? I think this is a topic that is uh, 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 familiar with most practitioners nowadays, uh, thanks to the NOAC uh, uh, campaigns that have been going on over the last 10 years. So the way we, uh, we classify patients that need anticoagulation is by utilizing nowadays the chads vasque score. Again, most of you know that chads vasque c is for uh, uh, congestive heart failure, H for hypertension, uh, age more than 75 takes two points, diabetes one point, stroke or TIA or peripheral embolism two points, vascular disease one point, age between 65 and 74 is one, and female takes one point. So this is the death chads vasque score that we utilize. And the, uh, the agent that we utilized and we've been utilizing is this rat bait called warfarin. But nowadays, we are in 2020, we're more and more utilizing the uh, NOACs, and there are several NOACs uh, on the market. Choose whatever uh, NOAC you, you, need to, you want to give. But here is the difference between the European and the Euro American guidelines. We've been practicing more the American guidelines uh, lately. Uh, is what CHAT score requires anticoagulation? Is it CHAT score of one, two, or three? In fact, in men, it's CHAT score, CHAT's VAS score of two. In women, it's CHAT's VAS score of three. I would like to have the audience uh, opinion about this. Yeah, we follow this. Yeah. You know, the, the recent ESC guidelines from a month ago do mention it gives a class 2A, so in favor of anticoagulating with a CHADS 2 VASC of 1 in males and 2 in females. So it's a class 2A, and then when you're above this, it goes to a class 1. Mm -hmm. So essentially, the only people who would not require anticoagulation would be CHADS 2 VASC of 0 
or a charge to VASC of one so in the same the European way. guidelines. European guidelines from a few weeks ago. Yeah, but the American guidelines don't recommend you to uh, to anticoagulate charge right. VASC of two in in FEMA. So which hence the uh, the, this chats VASC and adding female, why does, does female take one point, an extra right. point, if, if you're requiring three? Just yeah, say, it's confusing. Yeah, but uh, usually the guidelines, you will add one point if you have other factors. If you, yeah. you don't have any it's an add-on, uh, yeah. exactly. but yeah. even so, even if it looks like if it's an add-on factor, yeah. and you're not going to utilize it unless your chats VASC is more than three, why have it in the beginning? Uh, I, guess so I think it's time yeah. to take it away. Take to it out to, the, to uh, simplify it for, I guess, everybody, it seems that females are more sensitive to thromboembolic risk factors. So a female with hypertension has a higher risk than a male with hypertension. Even if they have one risk factor, they totally. seem to be more. Uh, can we interrupt you here for a couple of questions from the audience? Sure. So two questions about the same kind of definition. Can you uh, specifically tell us again, I know you mentioned it, but what would qualify as uh, valvular AFib and what would subsequently not be an indication for vitamin K antagonist. So specifically a question from Dr. Rashwan here. If you have a de degenerative calcified mitral stenosis with mean gradient between the left atrium, left ventricle of 9 millimeter AFib, do you give vitamin K antagonist or DOAC? Definitely vitamin K antagonist. Always, always. Sure. So in this case, uh, uh, this as we mentioned before, this is a valvular. Yeah. Uh, atrial fibrillation, sure. no indication. In fact, there is it's a class three indication to give a, a no sure. It's not that it's not studied. Now we do have studies uh, saying that you should not do it. So it's not class three, sure. okay, it's class three harm. So it doesn't need to be severe. Moderate or severe mitral stenosis or mechanical valves is definitely vitamin K antagonist and not DOAC. I guess the message is clear. Right. Should I move on? We can move on. All right. So what if my patient, what if my patient has end-stage renal disease or is on, dial on dialysis? Can I utilize a NOAC? So this is another thing that uh, people have been de debating. And a lot of the of our colleagues in nephrology don't like anti-vitamin K for their uh, uh, patients. So uh, uh, because it's a long discussion, we're not going to get into this. Well, nowadays, we are in 2020, we do have options. We do have drugs that uh, can be utilized in uh, renal disease patients, in dialysis patients. The, the one that made it to the guidelines is apixaban. So you can utilize apixaban for these uh, end-stage renal disease or dialysis patients and uh, be comfortable with uh, not utilizing an antivitamin kit. Just one, so one point. Bernard, yes. let, let me just interrupt you. Go ahead. Regarding apixaban, mm -hmm. what, uh, what what will uh, tip you? What, what, uh, regarding the dose uh, choice, do you prefer to give the two point five bid or the five bid? Well, so common question. Great question. So the rule of the apixaban is to two out of three. The age more than eighty, the creatinine more than one point five, and the weight less than sixty. So you apply the same rule. <coughs> All right. So it's not that because my patient is on dialysis, I should utilize a 2.5 once a day, whatever. Okay, so you apply pretty much the same rule. And these are, this is the, 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 the data that uh, came and made it, it made this recommendation. They utilized the full dose in people that need full dose and the low dose in people that needed low dose. So I guess just, a, so the data for Apixaban came from a retrospective analysis of Medicaid patients in the US. And in that group, they actually did show that the 2.5 BID did much worse than the 5 BID. Yeah, the so underdosing is a horrible thing yeah. to do. We believe that we're keeping our patients safer. We are not. And then, funny enough, the 5 actually bled less than the 2.5 in the dialysis patients. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it makes you wonder because people utilize 2.5 and those high-risk leaders. Right. So that's why they like. Could be, because it's a retrospective analysis, yeah. lots of confounders and bias, but right. do not underdose is a message. So it's a, it's a very important message because we're seeing more and more people being underdosed because people are a bit afraid giving uh, uh, no access to their dialysis patients. Usually these are friable patients. So one quick question from the audience. Would you defer rhythm control in patients with big atria? Let's get back to that. Let's get Later to that on. in a bit. Perfect. Okay. We'll, we will discuss the control in a bit. So let's continue with the case. The case, uh, the TE showed no clock, but her EF is down. Obviously, this is academy read myopathy because it's uh, something not to be taken very lightly. She had the left heart cat because, Dr. Khoury, that's okay. She had the left heart cat, but she had the left heart cat because she's 67, diabetic, 
uh, EF now first time to measure it at 30 per percent. <coughs> but you and I definitely know that this is tachyoda myopathy. Yeah. But no, but not everyone is uh, as uh, as smart as yourself. Uh, thank, thank you. Uh, so a left heart cat <laughs> was done, and then non obstructive disease was found. She got cataverted with 200 joules successful, successfully back to science for them. Everything is good. She went home on a NOAC, better blocker, and then interested. All is good. Her EF recovered on the one on the one month uh, follow-up echo. Patient was doing perfectly well. Well, guess what? Like any typical uh, uh, Lebanese uh, patient that are sometimes uh, meticulous, sometimes not meticulous. Six months later, she shows up in the ER with a stroke and in atrial fibrillation. Unfortunately, she had stopped her medications. She went back into atrial fibrillation and now not only in AFib, she's in she got a stroke okay so the CT as you can <coughs> see here shows that she has a stroke now the following morning she spontaneously reversed to sinus rhythm we started her on an antiarrhythmic the question is when should anticoagulation get started in these cases when should you start anticoagulation any idea from, from the audience from the panel so we have to go over the NIH SS scale. Yeah. Excellent. So thank you, my colleague. So uh, this is the scale that Dr. Rifat is talking about. So you do not, you do not, you do not start the patient on anticoagulation on day one because of the high risk of hemorrhagic transformation. This is a big deal because we've been seeing this recurrent problem, recurrent issues have been fighting with our colleagues in neurology saying, well, the patient is in, is in atrial fibrillation. That is a thromboembolic event. We should start heparin. Do not do that because there is high risk of hemorrhagic transformation. And this is clearly stated in the guidelines that if you have a TIA, you wait one day, not even, not even right away. You wait one day. If you have a mild stroke, Three. and this is definitely determined by the neurologist to tell us if this, this is mild or a moderate stroke or a severe stroke or a large stroke. Three days. So if it's, I have a large uh, stroke, these are the cases that will develop hemorrhagic transformation. Definitely do not give anticoagulation. Do not give anticoagulation for your stroke patient in the acute settings. Whether it is embolic or not, do not give anticoagulation. Whether the patient is an AFib or not, do not give anticoagulation. Whether you see a big thrombus flopping in the left appendage, do not give anticoagulation because you will switch the patient from an ischemic stroke, which is bad, to a hor horrible hemorrhagic stroke with herniation and, also, and so on. So you wait up to 12 days and you make sure by CT or MRI that you don't have any bleeding happening to be able to start the patient on anticoagulation. I guess we hammered this point to death, right? <laughs> so next, what happened? Three months later, in clinic, She's weak, she's tired, she's not happy. She's got melanin now, all right? So obviously she's bleeding. Her hemoglobin down to 8.7. As usual, at least at our institution, we send the patient, we send those patients to uh, GI workup. Have you ever found the, the source of bleed? Never. <laughs> <laughs> so we rarely find the source of bleed. The workup is negative, but the, but you know that the patient is bleeding, is bleeding from somewhere, all right? Sometimes we send them for capsule endoscopy, whatever, but we cannot find the uh, source of uh, bleeding. Now what? What should we do at this stage? You have a high chat score patient. You have someone who had a stroke even, and is bleeding. Do you anticoagulate, to anticoagulate or not to anticoagulate? The big question here. That's when you start thinking, I guess, not only following guidelines. You just start to utilize your brain, just not follow orders. You pay attention to details, right? And that's when you remember that most of these thrombi come from where? From the appendage. And 90% or more than 90%, these come from the appendage. And instead of anticoagulation, anticoagulating the whole, the whole body, there is a smart way of dealing with this called appendage closure. Occluding that appendage, will not allow anymore this clot that is supposed to form in the appendage to escape from this appendage and go up to the brain or to any uh, uh, other uh, peripheral artery. So 
This is the appendage closure device implantation. And the data on this is very robust. Now we have a plenty of data on this showing a superiority, not that it is non-inferior, it's even superior to just anticoagulate. There is a decrease in not only in cardiovascular and in, in, in all causes of death. Because here, when you put someone, when you stop the anticoagulation, that is a source of bleeding, you are prolonging life. So you are you you targeted the therapy to the area that causes the the, the, the clot. You occluded it, and you're now you can stop the anticoagulation. So the patient will hopefully not bleed anymore, and definitely you extend extend the life. So that's what that's why there were 32 percent or 37 percent decrease in all cause of mortality at four years. So this is a, there is a good data. It's not a controversial matter uh, anymore uh, that appendage closure is an excellent option. So she goes on now. She started to take care of herself. She lost weight. She's exercising regularly. We performed the sleep study because most of you know that sleep apnea is an important risk factor for atrial fibrillation. She's getting escalating dose of her antiarrhythmic, but she's still having long runs of atrial fibrillation on halter. What should you do next? What would you guys do next? What what happened to her EF? So her EF is still normal Recover, at this point? Yes. Recovered. After the sure. first episode, she yeah. did recover her atrial fibrillation. So I guess to be consistent with the guidelines, even from the get-go, anybody who presents with tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy should have received ablation class one. So and and that's a new concept. So we always ablate patients for symptoms control. Now the guidelines do reflect that there is a subgroup of patients who we should ablate for mortality benefit. And that's a class one recommendation in the ESC guidelines for patients who have proven tachycardia and or suspected tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy, like this patient. So in, those, in this setting, you could actually improve mortality, not just symptoms. Great. So exactly. Uh, management of atrial fibrillation rhythm control. The way you do it before we get to ablation is by giving antiarrhythmic. All right. I know there is a room, uh, there is indication, there is a trend towards going straight to ablation. But nowadays, I mean, uh, still in 2020, most of our patients, we like to give this pill. If I can control the arrhythmia with a pill, that is not that toxic, maybe it's not a bad idea, okay? So if you have no structural heart disease, you have you can choose any of these pills, but definitely you should not choose immunodermo because of its side effects. So typically we, cho we choose propafenone or flaconide for these patients, but you can choose any of, of the other ones. If you do have structural, uh, structural heart disease, if you do have structural heart disease, CED of heart failure, do not utilize class 1C. Do not utilize Ritmanol. <coughs> We've been seeing this over and over again, especially on those patients that got side effects from amiodarone. So you, patients on amiodarone, a year or two, now hyperthyroidism, thyrotoxicosis, what have you, we, the patient the, 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 that, that obliged the cardiologist to stop amiodarone, and guess what? They get switched to propafenone. Propafenone, 300 twice a day, 150 uh, three times a day, and those patients that have history of MIs or low EF, you cannot do that because of the reasons that were mentioned earlier by Dr. Rifat, that these cases cause ventricular tachycardia, cause white complex tachycardia, secondary to class 1C, cause sudden death. So do not give ritmonorm, propafenone to people with structural heart disease. All right? So the option is amiodarone. Or if you're lucky, uh, you can get the fetalite. It's a beautiful uh, option. So, but the first option will, will be a mineral for heart failure. And if the patient has CED, Sotalo is a great drug because it's a beta blocker and an antiarrhythmic at the same time. I know sometimes it's hard to find. It's not available in all countries, but uh, if you can uh, find it, it's, it's a, a great uh, drug to, to have. So the problem is with these antiarrhythmics is this. These antiarrhythmics can uh, do have uh, pro effects. You're treating a not a dangerous arrhythmia and the gap with a dangerous arrhythmia. So you have to pay attention to, to this. And you can treat the, the uh, AFib and end up with primary fibrosis if you're dealing with a mirror one. In fact, in the guidelines, in the American guidelines, they mentioned uh, specifically a point about a Owing to its potential toxicity, a should only be used after considering the consideration of risks and when other agents have failed or 
are contraindicated because we like to utilize amidronine right and left because it's easy to be utilized, but we sometimes forget about its long-term side effects.